Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. The brother Kareem Webb. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Kareem is a, a multi unit franchisee of Buffalo Wild Wings and CEO of, of, of Fourth Movement. Yeah. Did you ever imagine yourself opening up your own franchises? Uh, Yeah. I okay. mean, you know, like I grew up in a family that was doing franchising. I mean, so. Uh, from the time my dad went from being an executive to becoming a franchisee, that whole conversation around you can't inherit my job, but one day you can inherit my business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just kind of growing up, uh, you know, on fries, as I call it, mm -hmm. uh, I always knew that was a possibility for me. I mean, when I went to Morehouse College, I was going to the West End, walking up in polyester uniforms, working at Mickey <laughs> <D's>, So, <laughs> yeah, I think it was, it was always entrepreneurship and specifically the idea of owning restaurants in a franchise model was was always probably something I was thinking about. How did you get the capital for your first franchise? Well, his parents owned a bunch of franchises. Oh, his, yeah, parents yeah, yeah, yeah. They owned some McDonald's. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, you know, we, we went out, my, myself, my business partner, Ed, and uh, we scraped, you know, for years. And we good. opened our first Buffalo Wild Wings in 2009 after the market had crashed and there was no bank financing. Mm -hmm. wow. You just had to go figure it out. $3 million, had 21 LOIs, people, you know, closing the door on cats in their early 30s who wanted to open, you know, units in, in L.A., so it was tough. It was $3 million to buy into the franchise yeah. for each one? Yeah. Wow. It's different for every franchise that you want to buy into, right? Absolutely. Because I know it's really super strict with, like, Chick-fil-A. You have to work there for yeah. two years. Chick-fil-A, I actually, I mean, whatever you think about their politics, I like their motto because... Uh, it empowers people that otherwise wouldn't be able to have access to the capital, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about. I think now it's twenty. Used to be ten thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, you know, but if you if you work there, I know there's a lot of folks that operate those units making you know four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year who have a little bit of money in their deals, mm -hmm. right? And they're taking care of their family and engaging in community. So. Um, yeah, I, I say kudos to that model. I thought it was dope. But they want you to work uh, every aspect of Chick Fil A. You know what I mean? So they want you. Oh, to you are an owner operator, yeah, but that's how good businesses work. I think well, that's I mean, good. You have to yeah. know how yeah. to. Yeah. Actually what business do, do we know where, like, you know, mm -hmm. the the CEO of the business or the person that's responsible for the business executing every day doesn't work it? Correct. Now, for yeah. you though, I would feel like it was different because because of your family, you had experience and had more knowledge than the average person would before they decide to get into franchising. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, I grew up around the, the dinner table. I said, you know. I kind of got my MBA at Hamburger University of Reggie Webb with my dad, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, to whom much is given, much is expected, and hopefully we're, we're living up to that. What were some of those jewels that they put in your head, though, that, that trained you in a certain way? Because, oh, I mean, just because they do it doesn't mean the, the, the child will, will, will get it. It's really about a way of being, right? Like, you grow up in the restaurant space, and you're growing, you know, I grew up pretty middle class. You know, both of my parents came from single-parent households, South L.A., uh, so, you know, you know both worlds, but I'm going home, going to one high school, the kid that's on the in the grill cooking Big Macs right next to me has a different set of circumstances, but you know we're the same person. Right. I wanted to date the young ladies that worked in the drive through You know, mm -hmm. we went and played ball together after we worked. We were we were never not the same. So I think that was the, the main lesson. And then, you know, my parents were very philanthropic. I never saw them to this day take advantage of anybody or do mm -hmm. anything that was... Um, you know, suspect in terms of their, their 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 the way that they do business. How many Buffalo Wild Wings do you own now? We have four and, okay. and several more on the way. Yeah. And you and you said you started in old. First one opened in, in two thousand nine. Damn. In Torrance and in twenty eleven in the Crenshaw district. That was like in, in the middle of the recession at the time, right? Yeah, it was it was the opposite of easy. You were, it, I'm saying you weren't afraid. Hard. Uh, man, I think we were probably too hungry and determined mm -hmm. to be. I mean. Yeah, there's a lot of sleepless nights, and even after you open, it's not just, you know, you open the door and automatic, automatically you're successful. And we had one of the first, really the first Buffalo Wild Wings in L.A. proper. Um, so, you know, the brand wasn't like it is today in 2009, especially on the coast. There were none here uh, in New York. There were none in, in L.A. proper. So we were we were kind of first to the market. What mm. are some of the rules as far as the franchise that you, with Buffalo Wild Wings? Because I know that a lot of businesses are trying to get healthier also. Mm -hmm. So how does that affect you guys? Are there things you can add to the menu? Can you only have like what everybody has across the nation as far as what's on the menu? Are there changes you can make? Like I know things have to be pretty uniform. So what to own a Buffalo Wild Wings do you have to adhere to? 
I mean, when you are a franchisee, you have to, you know, what you leverage is your ability to operate well. And for us, that means developing people, especially young people. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a level of cultural competency um, um, and engagement with folks to run a system well. It's not like, oh, I'm in the Crenshaw district. I think sweet potato pie would do really well, so right. I get to do it. No, it's not that. And that's not why you get into a system like that. You're really leveraging the entire system to go, you know, get access to the resources, develop people, make a difference where you're doing business. So how, how does, like, people being more health conscious, has that affected business? Has that affected the business model? You know, I, I, I think in, in most retail business, you look at your success of, on year-over-year -year sales. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's people that are vegan that, you know, Buffalo Wild Wings is not going to be the first place that they necessarily Ooh, go. Sure even though, some vegan chicken. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, <laughs> there's some options, but, again, you know, it's wings, right, beer, KFC watch the games, have control, a cocktail. But you don't control that, right? No, we That's don't no, control, no, control that. But, that. Uh, but people again? do, like, uh, we see all these franchises adding Impossible Burgers and yeah. adding the uh, – you know, the vegan keep, chicken. and <laughs> Keep talking, Angela, because they're listening. Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, I mean, so I don't I'm think like, it's a bad yeah, idea yeah. because, you know, like Fridays, I'll go there now just to get the Beyond Burger. Okay. So, and even like Burger King has it now, so I just feel like it is a good option. I think so, too. So now when they test it, based on you, they have test it <laughs> in my store. So come to the Crenshaw District, Buffalo Wild Wings next year. I'm sure they'll, they'll make sure we have an Impossible <laughs> Burger or something. Let's talk about Fourth Movement. What is, what is Fourth Movement? Well, you know, I think the work that we were doing, being engaged in community, led, um, uh, you know, folks in L.A. to reach out to us when the city decided that they were going to make two-thirds of all the cannabis licenses go to people who had been treated unfairly in the war on drugs, mm -hmm. which is black and brown people around the country. We know we've suffered, you know, 75 percent of the criminal justice. It's currently a $10 billion industry. We own less than 1 percent of it. Um, and so, you know... In L.A., like other places around the country, you really don't see a lot of black folks who own things. Mm -hmm. uh, we own bu four Buffalo Wild Wings. I think we do it the right way. And so um, we stood up Fourth Movement, which really, uh, soup to nuts, does a lot of the things that we've been talking about today in terms of helping people um, capitalize businesses and stand up competitive uh, best-in-class retail units um, in the cannabis space. So we're doing it in L.A., um, we're just finishing training 60 people in Chicago right now, in the Illinois area. Uh, we know that we're going to be here next year. We think, um, I saw your governor last night, and I think that, uh, you know, we're going to see legalization in, in New Jersey and in New York from an adult use uh, perspective next year. And there will be programming and licenses. I think it's going to happen all around the country. Progressive legislators are going to make sure all around the country that licensing is available for you know, people who come from communities that have been negatively impacted or treated unfair around the criminal justice. The question is, are we going to have the capital and the resources and the know-how to stand up businesses in a really competitive space? Mm -hmm. right. yeah, yeah, um, some of the things that they wanted, the, the, the amount of liquid that they wanted was so out of the mind frame of what we would possibly have. It just yeah. made it seem like there was no way possible for us to do it alone. We'd have to come together and try to do it where it seems like it would be easier for a, probably a white businessman to get in that, that, that situation. Well, you know, so there's a medical market, mm -hmm. and like in New York and other states, they made you have to be vertically integrated. So in order to get retail, you have to, to have to grow, you gotta be able to manufacture and do all of that. Well, it's $50 million to stand up, uh, you know, a competitive cultivation facility. Correct. That's not attainable for most of us, right? right. So. Um, yeah, but now things are going from medical to rec. So I think they're going to decouple the need to be vertically integrated. So you'll have retail licenses. You'll have businesses that are in transportation. You'll have businesses that just cultivate or micro licenses or people who want to, you know, do smaller indoor grows or, or whatever. So you were going to see all of that, but it still kind of sets us up to be victim to some of the predatory actors. There are businesses out there that are set up to be cannabis businesses. And if you say, okay, well, we're going to have licenses for people who come from these communities. They're going to find people from their, those communities. But those folks' interests are, is, is not in the charter of that company. Mm -hmm. The company is not really concerned with whether or not you are making more money. What do you do with that money? Are you competing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for positive outcomes in your community? That's not what they're here for. So uh, that's why we stood up Fourth Movement. You know, cannabis is um, what we're focused on right now. You can raise capital. We can... Uh, do what we've seen in other systems where we can help people operate businesses super mm -hmm. competitively. And, hey, if we're successful with that, maybe 
this whole concept of social equity could also be possible in other industry. I, for, for us, our goal is 10,000 businesses in 10 years. And what, what kind of businesses? Because you, you're in the franchise, you know, yeah. business, so it'd be like, like cafes or something, like in Amsterdam? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you got Hilltop Coffee that's growing. Like, so we got one unit open now. We're about to open in Inglewood um, and in Eagle Rock in L.A. I think that's scalable. Uh, listen, like at Buffalo Wild Wings, our general managers make about 90000 plus bonus to make $100,000. Mm. In L.A., like it's New York. It's not bad. It's, <laughs> it's not bad, but when you consider that the median house to purchase a house is $650,000 oh. in, in L.A. County, you got to make one hundred and forty grand in order to qualify for that house at the minimum, mm -hmm. right? So there are other models where we, I think we can 100% finance folks to mm -hmm. own businesses um, where they get a much bigger percentage of the pie. It's not the general manager game. It's the ownership partnership game. Let's take all of the barriers for success away because I'm telling you, like we have, you know, develop people who started out as a server or started out in the kitchen and they run $5 yeah. million dollar businesses mm -hmm. all day long and, and 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 do the schedule for 80 people and make sure everybody's cooking everything, making every cocktail, you know, to spec. They can own that business. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. about access to capital mm -hmm. and some of the other things, you know, some of the real estate and acquisition entitlement, all of that kind of stuff. So that's where we come in and help folks in the cannabis space and eventually we'll be doing it in other spaces. Now in the too. cannabis space, do they allow you to do cannabis and alcohol together? No. I, and and that's one thing I, I never understood, you know, cuz why can't you go to a nightclub and just like you buy liquor at a bar, you have a cannabis bar and be able to smoke and drink? What's the, what's the difference to do it at a hookah bar? Envy trying to solve all the problems right here today. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, like, I've been looking into that for the yeah. longest. I was like, I just it doesn't make sense to me. Man, I, yeah. I listen, own a I was of in liquor licenses, and I was like, I would love to do that. But when it, I was in Jamaica at, at this outdoor festival, they definitely were selling pre rolls at the. Yeah, that was illegal. Well, yeah, that was, was illegal it? in Jamaica. That was against the law. Oh, well, no one was saying anything, and they definitely were walking around with the weed to sell, no problem. I'm talking about legally, you know what I mean, where you can go to and be like, you know what, I want to buy this. Well, it's on the way, right? Oh, there's no question. Yeah. I mean, we've seen a cafe just open in, in West Hollywood, several more on the way. Mm -hmm. You get legalization here or, or adult use legalization next year. There's going to be lounges. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's still a lot of demystification. I mean, this is, right. from a legal perspective, it's still very new. It's a $10 billion industry now to be $200 billion in a few short years. Mm -hmm. Things are going to continue to shift, attitude shift. And also, you can't even smoke cigarettes in the club in most places now either. So it's not but like you can, you can hookah, just because it's legal don't mean that you should be able to just smoke everywhere because some people don't like to smell smoke all the time, you know? Just do an edible. Let me ask you a question. How, how do you as an owner handle a situation <laughs> Like the one that happened in, uh, I think it was Naperville. Yeah. Where, where, where the black family said they felt discriminated in the Buffalo Wild Wings. How does a black owner, how does that affect you as a black owner? It's painful. But I'm going to tell you, like we sell, uh, you know, $5 beers after 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, I had a store in Carson where, you know, uh, we have Latino folks and African Americans and somebody might be a cowboy fan and somebody else is a Green Bay fan and, and folks get into it. Yeah. <laughs> Things that, you know, you might not think are the nicest thing to be said, get said, and you operate, you deal with the public. Um, and the only thing you can do is the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and these businesses are, are, are run typically by young people who are inexperienced um, and are gaining experience and mistakes get made. I think what you got to look at in situations like this is the quality of the leadership and then what happens after the fact. I'm glad to say Buffalo Wild Wings was acquired a year and a half ago um, that the president of Buffalo Wild Wings, Lyle Tick, and, and the brother, uh, Seth Freeman, who's the CMO, I've been in contact with them. I think they've been on the ground um, talking to um, Reverend Jackson and others, uh, the family itself. So um, I think they're doing all the right things to ensure um, that – we're as prepared as possible to try to prevent that type of thing happening. When we start talking about 1,300 units and the average of 50, 60 people working in each unit, mm -hmm. and you know the status of our country, and you got folks that support all kinds of people coming in these businesses, uh, you're going to have some of that. It's about, you know, how you respond. Yeah, and I mean, that's why one of the reasons I'm glad you came, because, like, you know, you start calling for, oh, let's boycott Buffalo Wild Wings. It's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's some brothers and sisters that will be affected by that. Let's yeah. let's put them on the front line so people can see what what it is. Yeah, I mean that, that you know it's exactly right. It's all we're all human beings doing the best we can to, mm -hmm. do, to be to do the best we can. I think the pressure that we ought to be putting on folks is inclusion around ownership. Word. It matters who owns these businesses because when you own, you hire folks that you're comfortable with. You're more. Um, 
culturally competent. You develop people in different ways. Listen, you're not going to let somebody maybe challenge you um, that doesn't that you don't feel like you know is respect respectful of your experience. Right. Right. But I have the ability to deal with or talk to a young person and, and bring the best out of them in ways that somebody else might not challenge a young person. So the fact that we own Buffalo Wild Wings on Crenshaw or in Koreatown or soon to be Chinatown, and you know, these, these places in L.A. means that we get to go out and make a really big difference. And mm-hmm. we think that we do. Uh, we just need more of us. You know, in L.A., you would think, you know, you go to Chicago, you go to Atlanta, you see black folks doing well. But how many car dealerships do we own? How many? hotels, major hotels do we own? Like, how much real estate do we really develop in a major way? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the answer to that question is not enough. Yeah, and and, a lot and of that that's is, where we need to be. And a lot of that is, is the reason why you're here today, because a lot of times we don't get to speak to people that actually own these type of businesses and these yeah. franchises. And, you know, we, you know, I was raised, I know Charlemagne and you were raised where we necessarily didn't learn about investing into real estate or investing into... Yeah franchises and a lot of people feel like they can't afford it they don't know how to so it's a it's, it's a scary decision i mean for myself you're the the only person that i've ever met that owns a buffalo wild wings that's african-american so that's good that we talk to these kids and talk mm-hmm. to these people to, to say hey this is how I, it was done this is how you can do it and because other than that there's nobody else teaching us how to do it and that's a great point and you said and kareem's not afraid to share the information how do you know when a business is scalable because me and you had a conversation and i told you about an idea i had yeah and was it jiffy poop no, it wasn't Jiffy Poop, and but the, the prototype is now in Farmington, Michigan, yeah. and you we flew out there together. And you, like, yeah. how, what 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 makes you know a business is scalable? I'm looking at the margins, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, you look at the fixed cost first. So how much does it cost? What is the labor cost? What is the cost to stand up this business? And how much volume can you reasonably do? And then you can pretty kind of decipher really quickly in the P and L: is there enough margin to make this worth your time? And and is it bankable? The bank is going to want to know over time because you don't want to use your own capital. So Mm -hmm. whether you're in the VC, private equity, or uh, you're going to a bank to get capital over time, it's about the margin. Is there cash flow in this business? Mm -hmm. They call it EBITDA, profitability, right? So can you figure out a way? Can can you drive enough traffic? I was Mm -hmm. in in Detroit with you or in Farmington with you. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about you, your brand, who you are, where you're talking about. Uh, locating that business, what the density is, can you drive enough traffic to that business to do the kind of volume that will sustain the fixed costs? Um, and then if so, great. Mm-hmm. And then is the brand cool enough Is the that it's scalable because you spend a lot of time on a business for one or two or three units? I'm like, at this point in the game, if we can't see it being a billion-dollar business, if it can't be 500 units across the country, let's go find something that can because mm-hmm. we got a finite amount of time and – African-American people, we don't have any really national franchises or national brands that we see that are owned by African-American people where we can really leverage the platform to scale um, hope. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're born into a lot of um, circumstances that that lack loving existences and that produces screwed up outcomes. You know what I mean? And, 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 And when you insert hope and say, listen, I ain't gonna make you wrong. You ain't gotta go to college, the next thing or the next thing. We can put everything around you, whether it's inception and a mental health gym, or it's a Buffalo Wild Wings, or it's a cannabis store, Mm -hmm. or whatever. We could say, nah, we could compete. We don't have to ask the government or anybody else. This is capitalism. We can uh, be self-determined about coming together and creating something that we're gonna support, and the general market will too, because the whole world has leveraged our creativity um, yeah. and our talent, and we haven't re- retained enough of the wealth to challenge the status quo in terms of our outcomes. And it's be, time to do that. I just be traumatized. Like I'd be scared to put my name or face to things because my father would always say, when you own something, don't tell nobody because your own people, black people, will, will, will not support. And then, you know, even nowadays, you might have some racist white people who are like, I'm not supporting just because but Not only that, they'll, that's come black to, they'll come to your, your restaurant and then be like, Charlemagne on it, I'll fall and slip and try to sue. Yeah. It's the same thing. Okay, so that's all in the margins, because, you know, listen, uh, legal expenses are part of doing business, or- <laughs> and everybody else is doing it too. We yeah. can't be looking at all the reasons why not to do yeah, it. Yeah, we yeah, got to yeah, be thinking yeah, about yeah. all the reasons. Come on, we to have do the it. juice bar in Brooklyn, and a lot of people come there because we talk about it. Yeah. Right, no, you're right. A lot, and Styles P has the juice bars, four of them. So, you know, with Juices for Life, I think having that is people seeing that you're from the community. I feel like a lot more people want to support than don't. 
there's going to be a few people that are like, oh, I don't want to go there. I hate Angela. But then there's going to be people, people that are like, that's so dope that y'all are doing this for the community and mm-hmm. that it's in the community that you're from. And so I think that means a lot to people more nowadays than ever. Well, we, we know that. You know, I'm, we have a Buffalo Wild Wings in the Crenshaw District. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm wearing the Fear of God, Nipsey stuff. That's right. You know, so people, Jay Lorenzo. Yeah, pe- yep. people care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, about who's making the stuff, you know, spend four hundred dollars on a pair of shoes. Who are you buying it from? That's what do real. they believe? Right. You know, how are they um committed to the things that we all ought to be committed to? Now, you know, I'm gonna ask uh with, with the businesses that you own, do the the government give you the same tax abatement and, and, and tax deduction as they give Donald Trump and Amazon and, <laughs> and Facebook and all those places where they don't pay taxes? No, hell no. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> now, how do how do we get to that level where you know you well, look you at Amazon taxes? that makes yeah. all this money and they pay no taxes? You look at Donald Trump, he pays no taxes. But then a brother like you, you know, who owns that, you got to pay taxes on the money. That you you pay. you, you got to scale. You know, they're not paying taxes because their write offs are so big, mm-hmm. right? They got valuations that are that are driving uh, investment dollars. Uh, they you can be making profits on one area and then investing in businesses and building out. Mm-hmm. Hundred, millions of square feet of um, warehouse space and other things or hotels mm-hmm. or whatever, and you get to write off all the depreciation on those businesses. So right. over time, um, you know, you, you cannot be paying taxes for a you long time. Do, yeah. yeah, and they, 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 yeah, we ain't, we ain't making enough bread they to know them tricks. Idea. Yeah. All right, well, well, we appreciate you for joining us, brother. You know, I, I'm grateful to you guys, man, for the platform and, and for the fact that you guys, man, represent a lot of us, and this is where we get our information, um, and you guys do it the right way, so thank you. Where well, can they reach you, Corinne? Uh, man, just hit me up. We were at Afrotech together last week. And yes, I can't sir. tell you how many people hit me up on LinkedIn talking about I want to be involved in the business. So I just say social is the best place to, to, to find me, Instagram, you know, whatever, Kareem Webb. Okay, and at 4th Movement? And at 4th Movement, yeah. All right, it's The Breakfast Club. It's Kareem Webb. All right.